Thanks everyone for joining. My name's Han Albee. I'm the Executive Director for the Centre for Public Integrity. Um, this is uh, the latest webinar that the Centre for Public Integrity is run. We are an independent think tank dedicated to fighting corruption um, and eliminating the undue influence of money in politics. Um, we run a range of projects, including trying to uh, set up a National Integrity Commission, get political donations, laws improved, uh, strengthen the integrity of our accountability institutions and rein in executive power, which is a useful and important one in this COVID era. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Fiona McLeod, SC, who's put out a recent book on corruption in Australia um, called Easy Lies and Influence, and Anthony Wheelie, QC, who's the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity. Thanks for joining me both. Um, before we get going, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, in which I'm joining from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and invite you all to do the same. We're all joining from around the country, which is great. Um, Fiona um, is a, Fiona McLeod AOSC is a senior counsel and is recognised as a leader of the profession. Um, having been the chair of Transparency International um, and as well as the Law Council of, of Australia. She's now the chair of the Accountability Roundtable, which is a body committed to improving integrity in public office. Um, she's recently put out a book, um, which I'll share the link to in the chat um, so you can all get a copy. Easy Lies and Influence um, is a book about corruption in Australia, what it looks like, um, and why it's important that we address it. Um, we all know that public trust is on decline um, and it's important to know that, a, that corruption is alive and well in Australia and needs to be acted upon. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass to Fiona. Thanks very much, Han, for your introduction. And uh, can I also acknowledge that I am currently on Wurundjeri land, also in the Kulin Nation. Uh, so we're somewhere close by uh, with Hannah and to acknowledge traditional owners across the country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. A couple of other acknowledgements before I kick off. Um, I acknowledge the invitation of the Centre for Public Integrity to share this important discussion around corruption issues in Australia and also acknowledge the tremendous impact that you're having uh, on the discussion. Um, I also acknowledge that I was a Labor candidate in the 2019 federal election campaign, and I acknowledge that disclosure of this fact both respects your intelligent and is consistent with precious transparency. And I should also, just for completeness, acknowledge that if everyone who has joined today, I'm looking at the numbers which have just clocked over 100 who've joined up today, buys three or four copies of my book. I'll probably stand to earn about $2 and I promise you I, won't, I will spend it, won't spend it all at once. I can say I did not write this book because of the lure of a great profit. In fact, I wrote it under some pressure of competing deadlines inevitable for a practicing barrister and those uh, and someone with an aging family facing the challenges of public health orders. But I did so because I think it's important to contribute to public discussion about the big issues of our time. Government accountability and threats of injustice, unfairness and corruption are right up there as far as big issues go. Can I begin with a quote and some of those amongst us with longer memories may recognise it. It seems that some people are extremely fortunate. Not only do they always know what is right, apparently by some special instinct, rather than any process of reason, but by some happy chance what is right always coincides with their own interests. Since they're always right, they never need acknowledge even the possibility of error. Curiously, such persons do not often seem to be chosen to carry out tasks where a degree of impartiality and integrity is called for, but at least they're constantly available with advice as to what, because it suits them, is automatically in the community's best interest. The majority of us, myself included, lack these unique characteristics and are sometimes troubled by the prospect that there might be more than one side to an issue and the solution may not be obvious and simple. 
This passage appears in an appendix to the final report of the Fitzgerald inquiry into police corruption. It concerns a ruling which have collectively become known as the homilies regarding the open and careful processes the commission was to adopt in deciding which material should be published in the public interest and which should not. Non-publication, depending on the risk of interference with law enforcement or risk to witnesses' safety or disproportionate damage to those involved. The nature of seriousness of the misconduct that was being alleged, risk of inaccuracy and other considerations that Fitzgerald mapped out. So in 1987, Fitzgerald mapped out the general principles for publication of the commission's proceedings. His guiding principle was open unless ordered otherwise. This general principle is not unfamiliar to judges of our courts in deciding issues of publication or suppression and are a consideration, a consideration of those issues is not a rare event before our courts. And yet in 2021, our federal government insists the only solution to resolving the tension between open justice and unfairness is to prohibit a Commonwealth Integrity Commission from hearing a case concerning a member of a parliament in public. This proposal, I have to say, represents an apparent change of heart for our former Attorney General, himself a former senior prosecutor, who no doubt had a role in the prosecution of numerous cases where suppression was argued and determined, and who publicly stated and was widely reported at the time that he was a staunch supporter of the Western Australian Corruption and Crime Commission with its model of open hearings at the time. So it's fair to ask what caused our former Attorney General to change his mind? What set the government on this path of insisting on closed hearings? Who influenced his thinking? What was he told or given to secure the shift in position? Who persuaded our former attorney, Christian Porter, that open hearings were intolerable, especially when luminaries such as Fitzgerald, Sir Anthony Mason, Murray Gleeson, amongst others, including members of the Accountability Roundtable and the Centre for Public Integrity, line up on the side of open justice? Who has influenced the outcome of this commission proposal? And in whose interest is it to suppress one critical part of the activities of the nation's first integrity commission? Would he have reached the same conclusion if he were designing the features of a Commonwealth Integrity Commission from opposition? Now, his decision has influenced the position of government. And when Senator Amanda Stoker, the Assistant Attorney General, conducted roundtable discussions on behalf of the government uh, earlier this year, when we were informed about the government model, we were told changes to that fundamental model were not on the table. So let's hope the current Attorney General has an open mind about it. Let us hope she's not so influenced by unknown forces and sees the sense in Fitzgerald's concluding remarks where he noted, one thing is plain is that there would have been no prospect of any prosecutions occurring if this inquiry had not been open for the simple reason that misconduct would not have been discovered. It is clearly better to expose the problems than to leave them hidden. Now, last year was not a good year in many ways, including for government accountability. And as we speed towards an election late this year or early next year, we will be confronted by similar challenges. The opposition and Michael West suggest that the government has gathered a war chest of approximately $4 billion of unallocated funding accumulated over successive budgetary cycles to spend on election promises. Now, the government seems to have learnt from the temporary embarrassment of the sports rorts um, event, the unconstitutional, unlawful spending of public funds in a manner that directly hurt small clubs and our confidence that government programs were meant to be designed to address need on a fair basis by reinforcing executive power to spend money where it's not needed. So they fix the problem by giving themselves more direct power. But it has not learned that ministerial 
staff or ministers themselves should be held accountable. It hasn't learnt that public funds should only be spent in accordance with an ethical principles-based framework in the public interest. And it hasn't learnt that for unelected staff to make spending decisions constitutes the worst erosion of constitutional power, in my view, ever witnessed in this nation. Make no mistake, whatever putative ministerial authority is now embedded into our spending processes, these are bribes and they're galling. Using our money to influence voter decisions in marginal seats is galling. The way in which corruption has become normalised in this country is alarming. The sheer number of revelations and mass scale of rotten public funds and complete disconnect between revelations and any consequences means that we are travelling badly on any corruption measure. And just today, the government tabled in the Senate a signed ministerial brief in which Minister Paul Fletcher describes the purchase of the Leppington tri Triangle for $30 million as perfectly sensible, despite the brief describing this land as being a small parcel of land, the purchase price of 30 million being described as reasonable, um, even though it was $27 million of a windfall to the landowners, because the brief noted a small window of opportunity to purchase exists due to mutual goodwill that exists between the landowners and the Commonwealth. So that goodwill uh, and the close relationship of the landowners to government was even spelt out in the briefing note. And as the minister described it, was perfectly sensible. So the government response to the tabling of this document today was to say that details of the deal had already been aired in Senate hearings. Nothing to see here, time to move on. To move on. So in resisting any form of anti-corruption commission prior to 2018, the government boldly asserted there was no corruption in the federal sphere and the commission was not necessary. This was evidently false as demonstrated by numerous inquiries and commissions, including the Coal Royal Commission and demonstrably counted the regular polling of the public service who reported high levels of corruption in the form of cronyism, favoritism, procurement and profiting without tendering protocols, concealment of mismanagement and destruction of public records. It flies in the face of the practice of plausible deniability, which has become standard operating procedure for senior public servants and their unaccountable staff of ministers, where false denial and demonstrably false statements made in press conferences are the norm. Now, we've, we know there are numerous cases where the government has spent our money money intended for public projects to deliver government services where they're needed to improve all our lives, spending of their money for one object only, which is to stay in power. And those numerous cases have been well reported by both the Centre for Public Integrity and the Accountability Roundtable amongst others. We're talking about billions of dollars that could be spent on aged care, the NDIS, hospitals, childcare, research, business supports, you name it gifted away to those who've purchased influence. And regrettably, we've slid into a style of government through press announcement, where denials and easy lies slip off the tongue and genuine responsibility is almost impossible to find. In my book, which I'll wave around in front of you for a moment, I note that we pride ourselves living on a strong democracy, but so did the American people ahead of the Capitol Hill riots in January this year. It was inconceivable to many of us and many pol political and legal commentators in the US that they would see the sort of frenzied mob mobilised by mistruth to seize power or attempt to do so through violence, contrary to the constitutional mandate requiring the Senate to instil the new president. And to see support for false testimony being led before parliamentary hearings. But we do here in Australia see signs of corruptions brewing. As well as this misspending of public money for personal interest, we see journalists and whistleblowers prosecuted, prosecuted for reporting the truth. We see the war chesting of billions of dollars 
spent on unmeritorious programs. We do see deception flourishing in our election campaigns with no recourse for those who are affected by this misinformation. We see the purchase of power by individuals who've accumulated wealth through exploitation of common resources and confidential information. We see cronyism, the reward for party loyalty by unmeritorious appointments and the punishment and persecution of those who stand up to government. We see the slow crushing of public offices established to hold MPs to account through the stripping of their budgets and backgrounding against individuals bold enough to speak out. And in the worst cases, they may openly criticise the very bodies established to pursue accountability, denigrating those individuals who held those offices by stripping their funding and finding ways to punish outspoken individuals. They assert executive powers that are unlawful. We see the overuse of FOI laws and the assertion exemptions and assertion of confidentiality protections such as cabinet and confidence and the assertion that staff are protected against uh, compulsion to inhibit accountability. Increasingly, they get away with it. Public resources are squandered, no one's held to account. Markets are distorted by the unfair commercial advantage of those who secure government contracts and trust in government and political processes falls. And meanwhile, we become desensitized and dishonesty is normalized. So while in America, we witness that brazen and willing subjugation of the rule of law, a country regarded as a beacon of freedom and democracy to so many, upon which it depends for its role as global policeman, it actually shocks me to realize how far we've come here in Australia to our acceptance of this mode of operation as a kind of new democratic model. It's easily alarming to uh, categorize the things that Trump got away with, the lies he told regularly, and to recognize those enablers of corruption are nascent in Australian public, or public and political life. So in my book, I talk about the fact that we're facing our own crisis moment, that we are paralyzed by the inability of institutions and governments to self-regulate and overwhelmed by the sheer weight of reports of corruption and the inadequate response of under-resourced independent journalists, anti-corruption organizations and parliamentary oversight. These are the conditions that allow mistrust to fester and nourishment for conspiracy and civil unrest. And that loss of trust feeds conspiracy theories that feed on lies, impacting directly the ability of government to deliver in areas where public response is so critical public behaviour in response to the pandemic, impacts of climate change, where government might be asking us to change our behaviour or accept policy changes that will impact across the nation, cyber threats. These risks are well documented. If we don't trust those who are sharing public information with us because they have spread misinformation and lied to us, we ask the question, why should we believe you? And I've already mentioned that corruption distorts markets and business confidence. The Australia Institute has estimated the cost of corruption in Australia at around 4% of GDP or 72.3 billion every year. And the truth is it robs our children of the promise of a bright future as funds meant for their advancement are spent on entrenching the grip on power. So, Accountability depends on many things. There's a framework. And most often we talk about the necessary building blocks being a strong National Integrity Commission. But it depends on many other things. It depends on the exercise of the right to vote by empowered voters who do so rationally. It follows that the electorate must be informed and that information about lack of accountability does not necessarily change the outcome of an election, but at least it promises that the truth is capable of being known. Accountability requires that those in public office tell the truth and that there's a means of holding them responsible for their actions, their omissions and ignorance, their decisions and indecisions, their statements and misstatements, and for the pursuit of personal gain above public interest. <laughs> 
It requires that those who work privately for public officials are accountable and open to interrogation. And it's maintained by, beyond the system of criminal justice and proper exercise of law enforcement and prosecutorial discretion, independent and trusted courts, oversight integrity officers and ombudsmen, and the administrative law and common law protections that protect us from the executive assertion of power unlawfully and with bias. Our accountability is maintained through robust parliamentary procedures and powers of investigation, scrutiny and reporting, through ethics, ethical standards and codes of conduct that cover all involved, elected and unelected, by knowledge, including the right to information concerning government decisions, dealings and contractual arrangements, fair procurement processes, the protection of whistleblowers, the integrity of markets and constraints upon sovereign risk. And it's most successful when sources of funding and conflict of interest are disclosed and then the conflicted takes all steps necessary to exclude themselves from influencing outcomes. It depends on a strong independent press and accurate reporting, reliable recording and archiving of the record with open access to it, strong risk management practices that recognise the emerging threats of corruption and their consequences, and fundamentally, it hinges upon truth. Be it a truthful telling of facts we prefer to whitewash and ignore, and that includes political exaggeration and prevarication, and it depends on things being disclosed and responsibility accepted, so the public may know the extent of the failing and vote accordingly. And above all, accountability is most dependent on the preparedness of the government, that's you and me, to insist that public office is undertaken by all officers as an exercise of trust, not the pursuit of personal interest. It relies utterly on the solemn commitment of those appointed to conduct themselves with honesty and to always act in the public interest. Thank you so much, Fiona. It's a, a wonderful summary of um, some of the problems and solutions um, in the area of integrity and accountability. Um, it makes me feel a bit overwhelmed with all the work uh, that we need to do together, um, but it's great to be uh, working in this space with organisations like the Centre for Public Integrity and Accountability Roundtable. Um, Next up, we've got Anthony Wheelie QC. Um, Anthony is the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity. Um, he's also a former chair of Transparency International um, and he's the chair of the New South Wales Crime Commission. Um, Anthony was a former Supreme Court judge um, from 2000 to 2012, including um, uh, being a judge of the Court of Appeal from 2010 to 2012. Um, and yeah, now is the chair of the Centre for Public Integrity. Thanks so much for joining us, Anthony. Thanks very much, Han. And may I, uh, first of all, um, echo Han's uh, commendation to Fiona McLeod. Fiona has been uh, a sterling advocate for integrity for quite a number of years now. And the publication of this book, uh, I would suggest is essential reading for those who are interested in integrity and accountability in Australia. The book uh, looks at the decline of democracy in the United States of America and the lessons it has for us. And I think in a very uh, careful and precise way, it suggests that Australia is itself on a steady downward path in terms of integrity and accountability. It's sometimes described as a slippery slope and uh, unless we stop or halt that slide, uh, Australia is going to be in trouble as America is. Now, the Centre for Public Integrity is concerned with uh, four issues really uh, at the moment. Our research looks at the undue influence of money in uh, politics, especially the problems that money poses at election times for uh, electoral fairness. And secondly, uh, we look at the decline in support for our accountability institutions, including the way that uh, bodies like the Auditor General and, um, and the ABC, for that matter, are defunded. 
And the defunding, of course, has a, a profound effect on the ability of these bodies to do their job properly. And we also look at the uh, really uh, the need to restrain untrammeled executive decision making. And Fiona's had quite a bit to say about that, both in her book and today. And finally, uh, we are supporting and have been for some years the urgent need for an effective federal anti-corruption agency. And so in my few remarks today, I'd like to deal with um, some aspects of that final point, especially as they focus on the New South Wales ICAC. Now, why do I mention the New South Wales ICAC? Well, uh, I would say that uh, one of the main arguments that uh, opponents of a federal body raise and raise continually uh, it, um, is the argument that ICAC has somehow or other um, acted unfairly to people and that reputations have been unfairly trashed. Uh, now, one of the uh, principal opponents of ICAC is the well-known journalist, Chris Merritt. And uh, Chris, uh, in a uh, what I would describe as a classic misunderstanding of the true role of an anti-corruption body, um, wrote recently, uh, just before um, Justice Elizabeth Fullerton delivered her decision in the Obed McDonald conspiracy trial relating to the granting of expiration licenses in the Bylong Valley. And in his article, uh, Chris Merritt said, in a well rehearsed and well traveled field of discourse for him, he said that ICAC is not a court. It's not bound by the rules of evidence. Uh, it's not bound by rigorous adversarial testing. It's not bound by the criminal standard of proof. However, Justice Fullerton, he said, is bound by all these things. That is why the courts and not ICAC will have the last word. The commission puts on a great show trial, but that's all it does. Questions of guilt and innocence are beyond its remit. So that was the passage that I hope I've quoted faithfully. And uh, Mr. Merritt clearly relished the prospect that the Supreme Court would find uh, Mr. Obeid, his son, and um, Mr. McDonald not guilty. Um, he said uh, this could be, that is an acquittal, could be the critical element that persuades the New South Wales government that ICAC needs reform. I rather suspect that he hoped that an acquittal might lead to the abolition of ICAC rather than just its reform. Well, sadly for Mr. Merritt, the verdict was a resounding finding of guilt. And it was a vindication really of the uh, 2012 inquiry nearly 10 years ago into this very issue by ICAC. So that far from ICAC's reputation being diminished, it has been enhanced. So I mention this as an example really, uh, and uh, as I've said, uh, there, there's a misunderstanding here and I find it uh, not only in uh, the writings of people like Chris Merritt, uh, but also I think reflecting back on Fiona McLeod's opening remarks, I think in my dealings with uh, Christian Porter, uh, this theme came up again and again, and that is the idea that uh, uh, a federal anti-corruption agency or indeed a state one really should be concerned to gather evidence for criminal prosecutions. Now, I don't know where the uh, former attorney uh, obtained that notion, but it is quite wrong. Uh, and let me just briefly say why it is. Uh, first of all, ICAC in New South Wales, like the anti-corruption bodies elsewhere in Australia, ICAC is not uh, part of the judicial system. Uh, it's an aspect of executive government. Its function is to uncover corruption uh, and to use special powers not available to the police, uh, not available to the court systems, uh, to use those special powers to dig deep in dark corners in an endeavour to find out where corrupt conduct lurks. I mean, it must be said 
uh, that corruption is not easy to uncover. It's so uh, easy for it to be covered up. And without these special powers, it cannot be uncovered. So the legislature in creating this aspect of executive government designed to uncover corruption, um, I think is mindful and correctly mindful that ICAC's job is not to secure convictions for criminal behavior. I mean, corruption can be criminal, of course, uh, but it's not always criminal, it, but it nevertheless remains corrupt. And examples like the sport rorts, sports rorts and uh, the car park, the government grant uh, that's been recently in the news and, and, and other matters uh, are examples of uh, potentially corrupt conduct uh, that is not necessarily criminal. But yet, nevertheless, uh, it's very concerning and it needs to be uncovered. So coming back to the point I'm trying to make, uh, I've said that ICAC's not concerned with obtaining convictions. It's no mark of a successful anti-corruption agency, even if no convictions are secured following upon its investigations. And its function is, is not primarily to collect evidence. Of course, it does, in a sense, amass a body of evidence during hearings. But um, the point that a lot of people don't understand is that much of the evidence that it obtains is not admissible in a court. And that's because of those special powers I mentioned. ICAC can comp compel you or I, if we're being publicly examined, to answer questions that might incriminate us. We can't just sit back and say, well, I won't answer it because it might incriminate me. We have to answer it. We're forced to answer it. We're compelled to answer it. And the trade-off is, this is really important, the trade-off is if I'm compelled to incriminate myself before such a hearing, that evidence cannot be used against me other than to form the basis of a perjury charge. So that ICAC might conduct a hearings and obtain a lot of evidence, but the majority of it, the really important part of it, cannot be used in a criminal trial. So once I think that is realised, we realise that the, there's a very big distinction between what a court does and what happens in an ICAC hearing. And uh, I also echo the owner's remarks in pointing out that the, the major commentators in Australia have all uh, time and time again pointed out that, um, that, that just how important it is to have public hearings and how you can't uncover corruption without them. And also, I think another point that surely most people understand is that uh, if, if you have private hearings only, and if you don't know what's happening, well, you don't know whether ICAC is surpassing its authority. You don't know what it's doing is proper. And so I think that the, the idea of, of, of an open hearing um, is very much consistent with what we regard as something important under the rule of law and democracy in Australia. I wanted to conclude really just by looking at the New South Wales ICAC. I was myself an assistant commissioner there um, during one year in 2014. Uh, I was asked to come in and deal with uh, three inquiries uh, into the conduct of Edward Obeid Senior um, at that time. And uh, one of them related to the uh, allegation that he had exerted uh, inappropriate influence uh, in relation to some cafes at Circular Quay uh, where his family uh, secretly held uh, interests and um, in, in circumstances where he did not reveal uh, to those members of parliament that he was lobbying, that he had these interests. And um, at the end of that uh, proceeding, some years later, uh, there was in fact a prosecution and Mr. Abid was convicted of misconduct in public office and served a time in prison. Uh, but it was an experience that was most interesting to me and it led me just to make these observations finally. In its report this in the last year, 2019 to 2020, um, what was really, what comes out of it is really interesting. 
the New South Wales ICAC had 2,416 complaints lodged with it in the one year. Of those, um, ultimately, well, I should just first of all say about 40% of them were what might be called uh, private complaints, and the remainder were a mixture of other anonymous complaints and complaints from public service heads or, or even ministers about the goings on in their own departments. So nothing surprising there, uh, but it's really what happened with those 2,416 cases. Um, in examining 1,494 of them were dismissed without any referral or investigation. And that proves that an effective uh, anti-corruption agency can, can filter out those complaints that are not worthy of investigation and do it very efficiently. So nearly 1,500 went out the window almost immediately. 182 of them were referred back to departments for those departments to sort out themselves. You know, sometimes it happens that a complaint will be made um, that somebody hasn't put in their timesheets properly and they've been paid too much. And it may well be true they have, but it, it may be in circumstances where it's, there's no corruption involved. And ICAC is very quickly able to identify such cases. And it's just a question then of referring back to the department so the better procedures are put in place. So again, nearly 200 of the complaints fell into that category and that left about 190 uh, further complaints, which were looked at more carefully and scrutinized. But again, finally, they were not the subject of um, any investigation. So that the number of complaints out of 2,400 odd complaints in the end that were investigated were 19. 19 complaints. And that I think shows us that all this fear about an anti-corruption agency assuming too much power and interfering too much in government activities and so on, it's nonsense really, absolute nonsense. And even of those 19 cases, um, there were uh, some, I think, 12 forms of conduct made. Uh, and only six matters were referred to the Director of Public Prosecutions. And as to public hearings, which, are, uh, which is the bane of uh, the opponents of uh, a federal ICAC, there were only four held in the year. So, you know, all of that goes to prove, I think, that, that those who are worried about it have nothing to fear from a federal anti-corruption agency other than those who do not want to be investigated. They have plenty of fear. Thank you. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, we've got a few questions coming in um, from the audience. Um, one is around uh, constitutional changes. The question is, apart from an integrity commission, are there legal and constitutional changes that could formalise some of the accountability requirements that our democracy needs? Do you want to start, Fiona? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, it's very difficult to change the constitution, um, as we know, and as those um, who are working towards in constitutional entrenchment of a voice to parliament for our First Nations uh, know how, thwart, you know, how difficult that is. Um, so first of all, there's the practical difficulty of entrenching a principle in a constitution. I think what probably needs to happen rather than constitutional recognition is the strengthening of relevant acts so that the legislation itself, which should be observed in terms of the objects of individual legislation, pieces of legislation and the creation of bodies such as um, the Auditor General have a reporting to parliament mechanism so the parliament, parliamentary oversight is a very powerful tool. And if you were build, to build those things into legislation, you would then create not just the ability for government to get reports and sit on them and then spin them as they wish, but for parliament to actually have the tabling of things. And an interesting mechanism might be to um, have some sort of process which ticks off on the ethical uh, or public interest aspects of, of funding, a bit of an integrity checklist so you can have a certificate of compliance, which is tabled along with legislation 
you could have um, reporting on spending. The difficulty is a lot of these things come out of unallocated un spending, which are then a pool so the government can make administrative announcements about spending without having to go through the legislative process. Uh, there, there's no parliamentary role in looking at the components of that. It's just picked up later by bodies such as the Auditor General. But increasing and strengthening parliamentary oversight would probably um, be a more effective way at achieving um, those sort of accountability requirements and certainly funding and committing to ongoing funding of those oversight bodies is critical. Um, can I uh, just add to that? Um, I agree. Um, you know, we put out a paper the other day at the Centre for Public Integrity dealing with some suggested amendments um, that could uh, make the uh, distribution of grant monies um, much more transparent and accountable. And we suggested there should be primary legislation passed setting out the guidelines for any grant program and, and, the, um, and, and the basis of a merit selection. Secondly, we suggested there should be reporting to Parliament from the departments administering those grants during the grant process, you know, tender, uh, delivery, uh, uh, and so on. And finally, we suggested legislative uh, requirements should be put in place for an oversight body, a proper um, oversight body, uh, whose function is to look at grants and report to Parliament uh, on a regular basis. Now, they're just practical suggestions. And we don't have to change the constitution to get a bit of better accountability around this vexed question of um, government grants. Thank you both. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in about integrity commissions. Um, uh, panelists are asking about, you know, why with, with effective integrity commissions working at a state level, um, why isn't there a national integrity commission? And further to that, are there, fed, are there examples internationally of integrity commissions um, working well? Um, so, so the first answer is that when the question of a federal, the need for a federal integrity commission was first raised, and it's been raised for many years, the government had no appetite to bring one in until it was forced to do so at the end of 2018 because it didn't hold the balance of power anymore. And the crossbenchers lined up, um, led by Cathy McGowan and others, um, to um, compel the government to make this an issue that it was committed to. So having committed to an integrity commission, it's then spent the next three years trying to have one that it can live with, or at least it can uh, sell to its um, uh, backbenchers. And, and that's the history of it. We were promised this at the end of 2018, and we're now near, now we've been promised we'll see something at the end of 2021. But as I've said elsewhere, it, the model that's being proposed at the moment is in many ways worse than having no model at all, um, because it will change the nature of the current oversight mechanisms, actually the Auditor General and so on, and and in effect create a protection for those. Uh, treated differently to law enforcement officers, which includes MPs and their staff. And I think there are a number of overseas anti-corruption bodies, uh, some more effective than others, some in countries that are far more corrupt than Australia mm -hmm. and, and which have had to battle very hard to combat corruption. So, yes, look, we're, we're not on our own here. And there are anti-corruption agencies in every state and every territory in Australia. So why? it is that uh, we don't have one federally uh, it is no doubt a mystery to some people, but to me, it's quite clear that the present government really doesn't want one mm -hmm. and it doesn't want to be held accountable and that's why it doesn't want one. But really it has nothing to fear, it, you know, if it just got its behavior back into a, a system where accountability and integrity uh, were, were routinely practiced. Um, that's all I can say on it. Thank you both. We've had a question come in about the Corruption Perception Index. Um, and seeing as you're both former chairs of Transparency International, um, it might be a good one to talk about. Um, can you talk through Australia's track record on the Corruption Perception Index and um, why that might be changing over time? So our standing on the Global Corruption Index of Transparency Interna International has shown that we've slipped in the ranking and then for the last few years that sort of 
stagnated uh, and we certainly haven't, haven't improved. Comparatively to many countries, we're not so bad. So this might answer the question about um, why aren't we worse? Um, I suspect it's because in large part, there's recognition of our strong principled and independent integrity oversight bodies and observance for the most part of the rule of law. The standing of our courts is impeccable, although that's put at risk through the mass appointment of ex-staffers to administrative tribunals and, and uh, occasional attacks by government ministers on our courts as left wing or right wing or you know whatever takes their fancy at the time. Our standings might also be because as government has asserted repeatedly, the sort of things that we're talking about are not recognised as corruption. Uh, they talk about criminal conduct, anti, you know, money laundering, foreign bribery, things of that, uh, qualifying as corruption. And so there's a recognition that those things um, are not widely reported in Australia. Uh, but as we know, corruption goes more much deeper than that sort of criminal conduct. So uh, that may be reflected in the corruption index as well. Did you have anything to add on the corruption perception index, Anthony? Ah, well, I think the absence of <laughs> the absence of a federal anti-corruption agency could be another factor of feeding into that perception. Mm. Um, there's a question about ministerial discretion. Um, and we've covered this a little bit, but it might be worth expanding on. What are the limits to ministerial discretion? And can ministers be kept in any way from exercising it? Um, or is it just a matter of their uh, personal or political convenience? Well, the sports rot was so shocking, that, that system, because not only according to eminent law professors and Toomey and, and Cheryl Saunders, amongst others, was it unconstitutional, but it was unlawful. The minister did not have a role in that case uh, unless she complied with the legislation with inserting, uh, asserting a power to spend those funds. Um, what has happened since that time is that there have been some uh, introduction of allowances for a minister to assert that discretion. That, don't forget, in the sports rules case, there was an independent um, sports commission body and for the minister to assert that power she had to have undertaken various steps that didn't happen so that was unlawful since then they've tried to introduce uh, various discretions to ministers in various pieces of legislation and as I understand it uh, with current spending uh, and I don't know the detail of this I've just heard this reported by Christina Keneally uh, in one of her um, presentations the prime minister has given to himself supreme power to make decisions around uh, spending public funds in, in some cases, some enormous amount of money. So I'm not across the detail of that, but um, certainly that is a grave concern. In any spending, there has to be spending in accordance with uh, general principles. And Antoni talks about this in terms of the legislation that, that control public spending but also there has to be compliance with the objects of an act. So for example, if you have an act that, that is designed to support sports programs across Australia or community grants or whatever the thing is, the spending has to be consistent with the objects of the act. Now that's pretty fudgeable uh, and the courts usually don't interfere with decisions around what constitutes spending that meets those objectives. But at some point, we're going to be on the outside of that. And clearly, the spending, you know, if you were to spend sports grants money on building a road, for example, it would be very difficult to justify that. And I imagine that would be subject to or susceptible to a challenge and judicial review. Yes, I think I'd add this as well. When we're looking at grant schemes where money goes out, ostensibly to benefit some sections of the community, but where the true import of what is done is to win votes at an election, and that can be demonstrated, then I think that brings in the ministerial codes of conduct, code of conduct. Mm. And I mean, for example, in the New South Wales ICAC, um, it is a corrupt conduct, uh, or it is potential corrupt conduct, where there is a serious breach of ministerial 
uh, the ministerial code of conduct. And we should have that re repeated in a federal body because it's a very strong argument, uh, for example, that what uh, Bridget McKenzie did in the sports courts uh, was, was a breach of the ministerial code of conduct in a serious sense. That is not just belonging to a shooting club, which got some money, but actually uh, doling out the money with a view to winning the election. Now, that's, that's contrary um, to the ministerial code of conduct where the public interest ought to guide the minister's discretion and not personal gain. Uh, so it's a clear breach of ministerial conduct. And I think that that may be an answer to the listener's question as well. Can I just jump in? Because Peter Wilkins has helpfully posted the reference to the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act, uh, which is the act that Antoon has been referring to in, in public conversations, uh, which bar a minister from approving proposed expenditures. Um, so um, thanks, Peter, for that reminder. And um, uh, as to whether there's an ability to seek judicial review of a decision made contrary to that act, well, I, I'm not sure that that's been tested in the courts, but the courts are prepared to consider appropriate challenges to misuse of executive power in appropriate cases. Thanks, Fiona, and um, thanks, Anthony. We've had a question around um, public hearings because obviously the system isn't um, universal at a state level. So there's a question here from someone in South Australia um, where the hearings are in private. Um, could you both speak about the different experiences at a state level and why open hearings like in New South Wales might be better than... Um, some of the closed hearings that we have uh, in other states? Um, well, the, the goal would be to have an ability for a commissioner, I would suggest, um, to have a discretion, to have a private hearing or a preliminary hearing before the decision is made to have a public hearing. And I think that's how most of the commission's working. That's certainly the Queensland model to my knowledge, and I think it's got a little harder in Victoria to meet the threshold, but certainly um, that's the broad principle. So there is a power there when the Commission of forms a view that it would be in the public interest to have a public hearing, for example, to um, air the issues or to, to expose uh, the public to the sort of issues so they can bring forward and generate more, more evidence that those um, public hearings are held. But as I opened with the broad principles around that came out of the Fitzgerald inquiry that might have resulted in the way Queensland do things, these things are very familiar to judges. They're very familiar to uh, corruption commissioners and they no doubt deal with them all the time. You, you can remember in that um, Dennis Maguire inquiry by the New South Wales ICAC, there was some of the evidence that was held in private because it concerned the Premier's personal relationships that was not an aspect not seen uh, as needing public airing. So these things are in the mix all the time and I'm not sure what the South Australian model is, I'm sorry about that, but I, I, it's not hard to navigate these and to find a test that's an appropriate test because clearly we need to protect people's reputations um, and that's an important concern. But how you do that when you're weighing up allegations of the most serious conduct and misconduct with the public uh, right to know versus their right to not have their reputation uh, besmirched is um, a difficult question, but one that we grapple with all the time. So, Yeah, well, I think that South Australia has always been the outlier on this. Um, it doesn't have uh, public hearings at all. And indeed, there's a restriction on what can be reported to Parliament. Uh, but, you know, that's, I think, been a great cause of concern for critics of the system in South Australia, and no greater critic than the uh, former commissioner himself, Bruce Lander, um, who, who was very vocal about the shortcomings of such a system. And, and well, he might be. Um, I, I would add to what um, Fiona said in this regard, that if we go back to New South Wales, which is always the bugbear, it's always talked about as the one where reputations have been unfairly damaged. First of all, I don't believe they were in, in the majority of cases. Of course, there will always be 
criticisms that will lead to improvements. For example, I think that 10 years ago, perhaps there was too much media influence on the New South Wales ICAC, and perhaps they did give the impression of being show trials to some extent. But uh, looking at the way ICAC functions these days, I think you can safely say that those criticisms have been recognised because there are now guidelines for the way in which a public hearing is to be held. And for example, uh, the guideline provides that a person being examined is entitled to have uh, any exculpatory material furnished to he or his lawyers before the examination. He's entitled to be represented at the hearing. His counsel is entitled to cross-examine on credit with permission. And before any finding is made against a person in that position, uh, he and his lawyers must be notified of the possibility of such a finding and given the opportunity to make submissions before any finding is made. So all of those things feed into making the public hearing system work to do its work to uncover corruption, but yet to afford procedural fairness uh, in an appropriate way to people who are scrutinised in that public way. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks, Fiona. Um, we probably have run out of time for any further questions. Just do either panellists have um, anything further they want to add before we wrap up? Well, I'd say buy Fiona's book. <laughs> you might make even more than $2 out of it with a bit of luck. Just, well, if you... Oh, yeah, thanks, Anna. You should, I just posted just, the link yeah. again um, in the chat. 20% um, discount. There you go. Uh, so, so if... There's, there's an incentive. Yeah. Um, look, I... I, I um, I would just urge, this is a large group of people listening in and some of whom um, will be engaging with these issues in many fora and listening to these things as they're talked about in the press. What I would urge is that, you know, our ultimate accountability measure is your vote. And if politicians feel that this is an election issue, they will start to shift their behaviour. So in whatever way you can, if you were to signal to your elected representative or those who are seeking election, that accountability and integrity in office are issues that you care about, then we will start to see the shift in behaviour. Because at the moment, what is allowing them to get away with it is that collective shrug of voters who say, well, you know, everybody does it, why should we care? We should care because it's our money and it should be spent on our future. Thanks so much, Fiona. Yep. That's a, a great place to end. All right. I agree with everything Fiona said and I have nothing further to add. <laughs> okay. Bye. Well, thanks so much to both of you and thanks for everyone for joining. Um, I'll keep you in the loop about uh, future work of the Centre for Public Integrity. Um, I'll add you all to the mailing list if you're not already on there. Um, so you can find out about our research, uh, future events um, and any uh, media coverage that we're getting for our work. Um, in the meantime, grab a copy of Fiona's book. Um, and as Fiona said, make sure to use your uh, political voice um, in any and, and all which ways you can. Um, thanks again uh, for, for being involved and have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone.